feed environments specifically, the way the algorithms seem to be playing is short format and high frequency. And so in those feed environments, frequency, sadly, to some extent, really matters now. Today I'm here at Juventus, at the headquarters near the Juventus Stadium in Torino with Mike Armstrong, Chief Marketing Officer at Juve. Hi Mike. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, and thanks for hosting me this in black and white little church where we are. <laughs> um, so, tell me about Mike. How is a Canadian in Torino? <laughs> it's great. I mean, I moved here with my, uh, my wife and two kids uh, just over two years ago. Uh, so I'd say um, it's a, I mean, it's a beautiful spot uh, to live. Uh, I'm constantly challenged on my Italian, but, uh, but it's, uh, everything's about learning. So for me, it's a, it's a good challenge. Tell me about your background. You've not, not always been in, in football clubs, correct? Yeah, so my background, I'd say, is uh, first part uh, consumer packaged goods. I spent about uh, 10 to 15 years at oh, wow. uh, uh, the beer industry, uh, food industry, really um, working on um, brand ownership, brand fundamentals, brand management. Uh, second part, I'd say, is, uh, is media. So I worked at a, at a broadcaster as well at uh, Google, heavily on the YouTube side of the business. And then in the last uh, three to four years, uh, really has been my start in sports. So first in esports, and then now at uh, at a big football club. Yeah, uh, shout out to our friend Alison Walker from Canada, from Toronto, <laughs> <Absolutely. laughs> who put us together. Okay, so <clears throat> clearly, as I'm talking to a chief marketing officer in a football club, let's talk about marketing and football. Um, I can imagine uh, your role as a part of B2B aspect and a part of B2C aspect. Can you do a like three to five minutes masterclass of what it means marketing for a football club? Yeah, so I'd say overall um, the goals are, are twofold. Uh, one is uh, help uh, build the audience base. And so I think that's uh, to your point on the B2C side. So how do we uh, expand and continue to grow our, our audience base? And, and keep those existing fans happy and with us. Um, and then on the um, B2B side, uh, we do a lot that helps uh, attract and bring in uh, partners, sponsors, licensees that help grow the commercial side of our business. So to oversimplify, um, we definitely tap into both the B2B and B2C side of the business. One I'd say more focused on audience development and then the other more focused on, uh, on commercial and growing the revenue of the business. But normally in a football club, uh, you also have a role of Chief Business Officer, Chief Revenue Officer, Chief Commercial Officer. What's the distinction between a Chief Commercial Officer and a Chief Marketing Officer in a so, club? Yeah, so I'd, I'd say the, the lines uh, seem to be blurring over yeah. the years because uh, I'd say on the marketing side, um, the, the scope uh, continues to, to creep. Uh, I mean, I think uh, when I started in marketing, it was certainly um, much uh, less complex than now. Now we tend as marketers to get into the IT side of the business. We get more into revenue. I mean, I have a team that works on direct marketing. And so for instance, um, that team is working on uh, paid media, programmatic media to deliver a sale. And so it's uh, no more that uh, marketing is doing uh, brand development and uh, uh, the commercial side is doing sales. The lines are, are blurred. At Juventus right now, I'd say um, on the commercial side, um, the more, I'd say, expected commercial line items, so how we work uh, to attract and to service partners, um, our stadium revenue, uh, and then our, um, our e-commerce uh, sit within the commercial area, and then um, pretty much um, the other commercial departments uh, sit within my, my remit. Okay, and, and the, the venue, the stadium revenue includes ticketing? Yes. So there is a B2B and B2C aspect also in commercial, <laughs> not only marketing. Yeah, which I is what, it was more. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's what makes it continuously complex. And I think uh, that's why um, a lot of football clubs and sports organizations, you need to make sure also you've got the right emotional intelligence uh, candidates in uh, marketing and sales roles, because otherwise you end up with a tremendous uh, infighting within the, <laughs> the departments. And so yeah. I think uh, the lines are, are blurred. They're going to continue be, to be blurred. And so I think um, that, that uh, the people side of uh, being a CMO or a chief revenue officer is, is really important. Otherwise, no, get, no work gets done because it's, uh, it's just fighting all the time. Yeah. And one thing that I, I, I wanted to ask, and I know you didn't prepare for this, so let me see if, if you're... I don't, want to be a, I don't want to go to a, too, too much a difficult question. It's about the... Would you know the list of channels, platforms on which you have the brand on today? 
Yeah, I mean, that's a complex question because there's just so many. So I'd say um, from a third party, we're, um, I mean, everywhere you'd anticipate. So whether it's uh, X or uh, Facebook or Meta or YouTube uh, or Instagram. Um, uh, Thread? Uh, Twitch. Uh, <laughs> we're not on threads yet. Uh, Snapchat, TikTok, yeah. uh, I mean, the list goes on. Um, a slew of, uh, of Chinese channels as well to serve yeah. that uh, area of the world. And then from an own perspective, we've got our, our website, we've got our, our Juventus TV, um, and, uh, and our, our, our app. And so, um, yeah. and so we... So the way own I, and operated and social, is there anything in between? So I, I normally, I'm not, not sure as a thing is the term, but I was calling uh, like instead of third party, second party. So you do, I don't know, Fortnite, Roblox. Do you consider them as the social or this is more a partnership agreement? It's not that you open your account and you go, right? Yeah, that's a good question. I think for me on the Roblox side, my opinion is it's a, uh, it's like a new social media. Okay. I mean, in definition, yeah, it's a it's, it's a partnership. Yeah. And so I'd say, like for instance, um, like EA. I mean, we're yeah. in EAFC. Yeah. That's a yeah. partnership agreement we have with them. Um, but um, but I, I see Roblox as a new community platform. So I would service a Roblox like I would uh, an Instagram or okay. a TikTok or a Discord. And so, um, but that's uh, that's I think where Roblox is going. Yeah. And in terms of organizing a team, because I mean, everything we're saying seems quite intense because uh, I mean, you marketers told me as that for social, every platform is its own language, the content could be. So how can you, one, if you want the team, but also the tools, how are you organized to produce this kind of, you know, content engagement, follow up, I can imagine the analytics. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot. I mean, we post each week more than 4,000 times across our wow. ecosystem. And so if you're going to post 4,000 times, the, I mean, the, the risk of upside is great, but the risk of uh, error is also there. And so mm. um, um, we recently built, uh, it's called the Juventus Creator Lab. Uh, mm -hmm. and we, um, we staffed and we've built, uh, I'd say, new competencies around uh, content production. Uh, we've really leaned into, as you've said, having like special teams, so like really strong experts um, positioned against channels because mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm afraid, I mean, it used to be you would build for one platform and then cut it and then spread it everywhere. And for some platforms, especially like TikTok, yeah. uh, you just can't do that anymore. And so right now, what we found helpful is finding people that are endemic to the platform mm -hmm. and then putting them there and letting them just do what they know and, and what they're good at. And so, for instance, we've hired a guy who actually had built the uh, largest Juventus um, Instagram fan channel. Um, actually, uh, at one point, there was maybe even an IP concern because huh. that happens. And, yeah. uh, and our approach to it was, well, this, this guy is actually really good at what he's doing. He's extremely young. Um, but actually, maybe we could bring him in-house and mm -hmm. he could be both a Juventus fan and then also work for the company. And so mm -hmm. we've had luck in um, also hiring people who are um, social media influencers and mm -hmm. then putting them on the channel um, or um, bringing fans in that have uh, built an audience already and then have them operate on the channel. Mm -hmm. So I'd say um, each month we look at performance across all channels. We measure each channel slightly differently. We have a prioritization, so mm -hmm. we don't, we yeah, don't, okay, uh, we don't treat all know. channels uh, equally. <laughs> we don't want to uh, know. <laughs> no, it's probably not a good one to go into. Um, <laughs> but, um, but what the Juventus Creator Lab f um, uh, positioning has helped us do, and then we've got a center in between the um, stadium, uh, our yep. headquarters, and where the players uh, practice. That's helped us on frequency. And okay. so, uh, in the last season alone, we've grown um, uh, uh, two billion more video views versus the season prior, which is like a fifty percent increase uh, one season over the next in terms yep. of how many views we're outputting. And so. Uh, unfortunately now, as you said, you do need to have special teams experts across the channels, ideally. And then the frequency that's required to yeah. stay relevant is just getting higher and higher, yeah. it seems. Yeah. So quite a fascinated approach of including 
I would say organically uh, from the bottom up influencers and people that create great content into, into the team. It reminds me a bit with the different approach of what the NFL is doing in the US with, I, I don't remember how it's called, access program. So they take IP content that they own from the NFL, from the games, and they give it to a, a select a group of creators for free at the moment, and they don't revenue share, so they can take it and create. I think it's a way it reminds me a bit also of uh, PK Kings League. So you don't start from football, you start from the or you combine the audience and the creators and football. Uh, you think it's something, you're going in that direction too? Yeah, we've experimented a little bit, especially with our, our core audience of uh, allowing them to design what a jersey could look like or what a kit could look like. Uh, so we've, we've done some of that. I think for the, the really core fan that wants to be more hands-on and more involved, uh, that's a great exercise to do. And there's one thing that uh, also came to my mind because you mentioned before the frequency, etc. I remember at some point uh, we were because we always meet at conferences more than Torino. You said uh, it's sad to say, but I am started to think that quantity beats quality. Can you define that sentence? Yeah. So um, I, I'm sure I'll have people who disagree with this, but my <laughs> my feeling is that um, we're all anyone in football, anyone in the entertainment sphere is is fighting for attention, not just against their um, vertical or their category, but against everyone. And unfortunately, today attention is often earned in feed environments, and in feed environments specifically, the way the algorithms seem to be playing is short format and high frequency. And so in those feed environments, frequency, sadly, to some extent, really matters now. Uh, in, uh, in others, long form and uh, beautiful, uh, heartwarming storytelling is, uh, is still relevant. But if you're trying to vie for attention in a feed environment, high frequency is, uh, is really important now. Yeah, uh, that's maybe the success of YouTube Short, which at the beginning, was really, I mean, I saw it as a copycat, defensive copycat from YouTube. It started to take a, a life on its own, I would say now. Yeah, and it's not uh, better or worse, no. uh, because I mean, people are spending a lot of time on, uh, on YouTube watching shorts or on, uh, on TikTok yeah. uh, scrolling. I mean, now people are using TikTok as a, like a search vehicle. Uh, so I, I don't think it's uh, better or worse, but, uh, but in those feed environments, when people are used to snacking, if you don't have a high frequency, then um, ultimately you get served up you, last. You don't, uh, you don't you appear, don't, you disappear yeah, somehow. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's a, good, yeah. Uh, that's a good point. So the brand of a football club in Europe has so much loyalty that not even Apple has. It goes from generation to generation. And on one end, at some point, I always thought it's a meta brand that it's not owned by the current management of the club, but it exists in, in fans land or somewhere. Uh, what is your approach in, you know, as you're an expert in brand? How do you see that? Yeah, I, Who owns I, the brand? Yeah, I agree. I think the brand is an intangible asset. Um, but if I were to summarize it, maybe it's a, like an aggregation of fans' perception. And so you're right in saying the club doesn't... Uh, own the brand in a way. The brand is a, an aggregation of um, the perception of all of the supporters that we have. And mm -hmm. so that's why it's uh, really important to, to nourish and to be uh, careful with uh, and to help promote in the right way. Otherwise, um, the intangible value uh, can quickly uh, diminish or go away. On the other end, I, I remember you discussed this uh, at conferences also. A football club brand, like many other brands that are influenced for external factors, societal factor, or selecting the wrong testimonial, things like that we have seen recently, um, is influenced by the sport aspect. What happens on the pitch? Uh, is the club doing well or not so well? Based on the expectation, I'm a Torino fan, so <laughs> if Immobile, an ex-player, scores, I'm still happy now. So. <laughs> How do you create this kind of independence of the brand from, from the sport, if that uh, what seems to be a good idea or not? It's difficult. I mean, in, uh, in football and sport, the brand at any given moment is uh, often tied in some way to the performance on the pitch and the players. Um, and so uh, being a marketer in sport, I've said in the past to you, uh, you have to be a bit of a glutton for punishment because there's a, <laughs> there's a volatility, volatility aspect that is, uh, is out of your control. It's like the, 
the quality metric of your, your brand can uh, change from one season to the next. Um, that said, I think the opportunity in sport for sport to invest more in brand building is tremendous because there's not many brands or products around the world that, as you said before, have this like a really close, passionate mm -hmm. audience. And so I think for me, sometimes the problem that I see in sport is they've got the diehard fan base, but then they don't invest in brand like a consumer packaged goods company would. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. maybe the upside would be tremendous if they invested a bit more in brand in, in brand building um, uh, tactics along the way. And so, I mean, Juventus has a tremendous history. Um, we have a, a positioning in the marketplace. We've got a, a family and an Italian heritage. Uh, we've gone through a, a new visual identity. There's some really unique assets there that mm -hmm. um, could help build the brand um, to be football at the core, but then other things. And then we see also with young people now, they're starting to choose their club more for um, being entertained by content. And mm -hmm. so that's picking a club based on content and entertainment value and less so about performance on the pitch and players. And as we see um, young people change their consumption habits, they're still attached to players, but maybe consuming the pitch in a different way. And so I actually see more upside in building brand through storytelling with younger audiences today. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the, how, how clearly football works in terms of the other aspect, media rights. So now there is the new cycle. So imagine we are already in the new cycle with Dazon um, having uh, you know, quite five years. So in theory, what I'm expecting, I also talked to the people at Serie A, at Liga, at Lega Serie A, is there, there is space for innovation. Five years, people can invest more, you're together for a long time. The next cycle will be a big question mark. How, are, how is a club involved in what happens, you know, in terms of broadcasts, etc.? I'd say uh, within the Syria, I mean, the clubs work closely with the league and so we're with them supporting as they need it. Um, but ultimately, it's the, the league that's shaping uh, the strategy and the direction on uh, where the, the league wants to take the broadcast and then the innovation. And so we're there as a sounding board and we're there to support, but we're not the main driver the league is. Um, but you don't see the, the clubs be more like, I, I could imagine, I don't know if it's done here, the NFL puts uh, all clubs together in terms of digital and, and content people and creative people uh, every time around the Super Bowl or just a bit before to you know, have creative ideas together. Not for the top, maybe the production one, but for everything else around it, which as you said, with the new generation is becoming super important. Yeah. I would say that, that that happens. I think it could happen more. I mean, uh, it's interesting you bring that up today. I mean, actually, um, uh, tomorrow we're going to have a match where we've worked with the league and they're bringing to life this um, body cam, which is uh, quite interesting and a first for Syria. And so I'd say that the league is pushing uh, on new innovation and the clubs are involved. But I think there's always opportunity to get everybody uh, around the table more often. Yeah. Can you tell me a bit more about the body cam? Yeah, so the intent is uh, to get a, a really um, first-hand, almost uh, first-person point of view uh, on a, a player as they're um, practicing before the, the match uh, on the pitch and to get that, that perspective. And so it's a, a new way to try to keep people engaged in, uh, in the live broadcast, uh, feeling more immersed in the experience. So I've heard so much about you now the fan, the fluid fan, Gen Z and uh, so fan engagement. So there's so much talking about in our industry, and I'm also one of the guilty ones um, about fans. From your point of view with your work at Juve, how do you see fans in respect to what you have to do? So, I mean, fans for us are at the center of everything. And so we, um, we try to get as much uh, research and data as we can on our existing fans so that ultimately we can better the experience and the product that we, we give to them. So, I mean, fans are talked about every day, all day long. I mean, that's core to the marketing function. Um, I do, I've, I'm a, a marketing geek uh, like yourself, and so I've read uh, all the studies on the fluid fan <laughs> I, I quite like. Um, I think the, the human's challenge now for especially younger fans, um, but I'd say all fans, is, is just the, the availability of content that you have at your fingertips. And so the challenge now is, probably most uh, sports uh, leagues and clubs are gonna have either less time now with fans than they've had in the past, or they're gonna see um, that diminish in the coming years. 
And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It just means that the, it, with the time that you have with your fans, you have to try to make the most of it. Because I mean, uh, now uh, uh, we're competing for time with uh, Netflix, uh, Amazon, uh, DAZN, uh, every sports club, every league. And But so, also non-sport content. Absolutely, and so I think uh, from a from a fluid fan perspective, for me, it's uh, it's more about um, you need to put the fan at the center and and be conveniently placed where they are, uh, and then when you have a moment with them, leave as much of a, a positive mark as you can. Um, otherwise, you you miss an opportunity with their fan. Uh, maybe they don't come back, or maybe they spend less time with you the next time. And I think that's the the challenge that we all have now. And in terms of uh, so to go about more in marketing terms, but segmentation, there is a clear one, or obviously it's more sophisticated, but the basic one is the one that supposedly are coming or can come to the stadium and everybody else. Without uh, telling all your secrets, what I think it's more sophisticated. What is the segmentation eye level that you have? Yeah, so of how do you approach it? So we've got two, two types. We've got a, a global segmentation that we've done that looks at uh, different uh, fan segments. Um, the, uh, the challenge is, is uh, there's, there's quite a few, and so you have to really uh, know and then also try to prioritize where is uh, the time that you, you can spend um, with, with each. Um, and then uh, from a first party database perspective, we're doing audience segmentation within our, our CRM um, to try to match that up with what we know from research. And then we can get smarter at being more personalized with uh, fan experiences on things like um, stadium, e-commerce, membership. Uh, we can offer uh, more personalized experiences at the right time to, to those, those fans. So audience segmentation for us is in two places, one in a more like research and academic, yep. and then one in a more real-time CRM database. Yeah. And in terms of, um, okay, I had this idea a long time ago that I don't think, a lot of people told me it was a good idea, but I haven't seen anybody doing it, that you should have a, a club or a sport entity should have a CFO, but not a chief financial officer, chief fans officer. <laughs> so who's represented the fans in the club? This, is, this can be provocative because Fans at the center, fans at the center, like, are, do you have physically or digit, I mean, virtually fans involved in the decision, like the creator, creative or creator, creator lab? lab. Yeah. Creator lab or things like that. Yeah, so what we do is we, um, we do have a, a, a team of people that focus on uh, our, our fan club, our membership, uh, fan associations, and I mean, their full-time job is to work with those groups. Uh, we do have uh, regular feedback sessions with them. We have uh, annual, annual meetings where our fan clubs from around the world actually come together. Uh, and so that's a, a great time for us to get live feedback. And then within the marketing department, we have uh, focus groups on a regular basis now. Uh, we do surveys um, to try to get as much feedback as possible. So we don't have a chief fan officer, <laughs> uh, but we do have someone within the commercial area, actually a, a few people in the commercial area, and then uh, a team within the marketing area that's strictly focused on like uh, the, the fan uh, and uh, because it's so core to the business. Yeah, okay. And switching subject, What about the sponsors? Very often I have the impression, not from you, I mean in general that sometimes you need to find excuses to create content that then you can sell to sponsors. I'm not, <laughs> that's my impression. Um, so it's, it's a provocative question, sorry. But how, how authentic is this relation between you, the, the sponsor, the fans? I think, uh, I mean, good branded content is done where there's an intersection on what the sponsors um, I guess uh, center of gravity is uh, and how it intersects with, uh, with a club. I think that's uh, generally when you see the most authentic branded content that's done. And so our approach isn't to build it and then slap a logo on it. Uh, we really need to understand like what is it that our, our sponsor or partner is, um, is looking to, to achieve. If content is a solution, then uh, we start getting into, okay, well, what's the, what's the purpose uh, of the, uh, the partner? What's the tone of voice? Uh, what are the stories that they want to tell? And then we work with them on it. I think if you do it the other way, then that's where, as you said, it probably feels like a, a content factory with a sponsor marks on it. And that's not the, the right approach in my opinion. So in the last 10 years, the relationship with the sponsors is real and what the sponsor want or expect from a brand like, like a football club 
is really different. My feeling is it's changing a lot. It's changed a lot. I mean, as you know, I've been on a, kind of every side yeah, of the equation, yeah, yeah. whether it's agency or yeah, broadcast yeah. or brand. And I think the expectation now from partners, sponsors is, is, uh, is high. And uh, for them to see the return on investment that they need, um, I think sports properties need to act more like agencies servicing their, uh, their sponsors and, uh, and partners and less like uh, an IP provider uh, that gives them reach. Uh, I don't think that that model works anymore. And uh, normally well, the creative, because I'm always fascinated to the beginning of an idea, right? So for example, I was, we were in Rome together and I was interviewing Antonio Cacorino from Apex Capital. And he, he created this investment fund with um, athletes, uh, football players, Formula One drivers, because, and I said, but well, how did it happen? Okay, I knew this, uh, you know, these people and uh, we were all bored during COVID. So we started doing calls to say, hey, why don't we do something together? So. Uh, how is in, in your creator lab, and not only for sponsor, but uh, if you, if what is your you know, idea that you loved that you then we were able to execute uh, in the last two years, and how did it start? Because I'm fascinated by the start of things. Yeah. So the the idea on the creator lab initially was my feeling was that sports content and club content was still built the same way that it's been built for many many years, and so we were missing the way to communicate on specific platforms that the way um, people expect now. And so the thought was, how do we place influencers, uh, young social media managers, uh, old school uh, TV broadcast people, but everybody in one space, really with creativity at the center. And so this was the initial idea on, on building the Juventus Creator Lab. Um, recently, I'd say one uh, success that we've had was um, we built a a documentary that uh, we um, we uh, sponsored or we, we sold, I'd say, to, to Amazon, and we launched on Amazon Prime uh, just over a year ago. It was uh, number one in Italy on Amazon Prime. It was distributed worldwide. But really, um, what we try to look for when it comes to long-form storytelling is like what are the really heart-wrenching um, stories that we have to tell, and let's focus there as opposed to focus on maybe big star players that um, have big audiences, but really the story isn't as interesting. And so we tend to be story led versus uh, player led. Um, over the past few months, we've still told stories about um, uh, women's rights, about uh, players that have suffered from um, major, major uh, unexpected health problems, not even related to the pitch. Uh, stories of uh, players that have come from like kind of uh, rags to riches, like from really mm -hmm. tough environments uh, when they grew up. And so right now within the Juventus Creator Lab, we're gravitating towards these like really human, heartfelt, uh, emotional stories and less so about the um, uh, stardom and uh, classic football stories. I, I agree because I, when, I, when I see content created by you know, broadcaster, I still think there is kind of more authentic level that is starting to come out. Even in the backhand documentary, I have to say, forget the, the family, the football, the way the football is told, is better than average. Yeah. And in theory, football is an excuse there. It's not, yeah. they're not, the documentary is not about football. No. Huh? But the way they, told, they tell the story about these few moments of drama in football, super emotional. I love the way, and I think there is a lot more story. And even, I was expecting some, you know, uh, I'm an uh, utopian, but you know, the, even the big guns in football that at some point become president, I think they have a lot of story to tell about football, but we always talk about something else. So yeah, I think as more as you can go story first and authentic, and I think that, that seems to be a good recipe for long form especially. Yeah, it's working all so far from what we can see on the, on the metrics, um, but, uh, but we, we keep experimenting. I mean, uh, that's, that's, that's uh, never ending. Yeah. So without going in specific of revenues of one club or league, etc., clearly um, there are challenges in keeping this business both on the media side and the sport, sustainable. How do you see the monetization from a club perspective evolving from now on? I think most clubs so far, if you look at their revenue, the majority of it sits within uh, revenue generated from broadcast or from sponsors. Yep. Uh, the B to C side is, uh, is small. And so I think what we're gonna see and what we're already seeing is Clubs trying to understand how they can unlock more direct to consumer, direct to fan dollars. The difficult moment right now is a lot of clubs have these really big, vast digital ecosystems with 
fans of, let's say, all levels, but they're having a hard time finding out how to, uh, how to convert off of those really large audiences. Things like um, uh, uh, in arena, skins and video games, and uh, digital assets um, haven't really fully infiltrated into, call it traditional sport yet. And so right now, my feeling is there's the shift towards direct to consumer, but a lot of difficulty around how exactly do you unlock, let's say, material or meaning, meaningful uh, dollars within that space. And so some clubs are taking the approach where they're saying, there's not a whole lot of money there, so let's not focus on it and let's outsource. And then others are going all in, kind of hoping and praying that there's gonna be more ways to monetize directly that are meaningful over the years. And I'm not trying to be tough on the direct to consumer side, there is money there, but for most clubs, if you look at materiality, it's just not that large at this moment. And so um, I'm a, an optimist at heart. And so <laughs> my, my belief is the direct to consumer side is a really interesting area that's, that helps clubs in many ways. Um, and that one day, and I'm not sure if it's in uh, three years or five years or 10 years, there's gonna be more digital assets that can be sold worldwide that can really be meaningful for clubs and help them on materiality in terms of revenue. But I think today, we're not just there, we're not there yet. One of the tension that I see, as I was often always had to say, on the vendor side, vendor of all own and operated experiences is big tech, whatever you want to call yeah. it, uh, big tech social, uh, and own and operated. So what you're saying there to consumer is what basically the Amazon and the other big guys are already doing themselves. So the fact that a small entity compared to this size can operate their own, seems not an easy one. On the other end, if you don't do it, you're also not learning the language of direct-to-consumer. So I was discussing with different properties, league, etc. Uh, you know, five years ago, everybody wanted to go TT, obvious. Now nobody wants to, I mean, almost nobody wants to do it, right? Yeah. Because if you're like small, it's alone. Difficult. Yes, but if you don't learn and you really play with it, you will be less um, ready when you have to negotiate the next deal, when you have to you know, do a partnership with these people, because they understand they're to assume and with all respect, you kind of don't. Yeah. So I, I also understand that you, know, you, you have to do it in a way without losing too much money, but, but I think if you just don't do it, it's super dangerous. Yeah, it's difficult. I mean, I think uh, from, a league, from a league perspective, for me, you have to be there. I mean, uh, I if you're not investing in a direct-to-consumer as a league, then I think uh, even from a negotiation perspective, yeah. you, you, you've lost that negotiation vehicle. From a team, it's harder because the main asset often is uh, the match and then all of the assets around it often are all over social media, they're all over the news, they're all mm. over uh, every channel out there. And so getting people to come back every day is a bit, that's where it gets more challenging. Um, even summer friendlies that we have, for instance, we uh, often don't have the rights to even those broadcasts. And so for us, it's, it's, it's difficult. And so to your point, I totally agree it's difficult. I do think though, you're right, um, you do lose touch of your fan, you lose touch of your customer if you're not at least experimenting and uh, building um, that uh, valuable first party fan data. I mean, if you're not getting it as a club through uh, an OTT or a fan loyalty project or something that's one-to-one, uh, -one, where else do you get it from? I mean, you probably don't. Uh, there's not all that many areas that clubs can pull this really rich um, depth of data on their fans. And so um, I agree that it's tough, uh, <laughs> but I agree that as a club, if you're nowhere uh, near it and not experimenting, that there's, um, there's missed opportunities. Yeah, there could be usually disconnect when things change. Yeah. One of the things that people in, in your position, I think I've often asked, and I've seen it myself is, yeah, but as a club, okay, you don't have the live uh, football rights, but you have the players. So can you define an answer to this <laughs> quote statement that is possibly not so true? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's true and it isn't. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of media have access to our players. And so, I mean, that's the, the short answer is uh, whether it's a DAZN or, um, or any local news, I mean, they get access to our players. And so it's not like we have exclusivity over, over our players. And then uh, players themselves are becoming their, their own brands and they're uh, in a way competing with uh, clubs 
uh, these days, especially you see players now more and more with their own agencies and their own personal social media teams. And so um, players are building their brands and their IPs that are totally disconnected from the club. And so um, players are uh, critical and at the heart of uh, every sports team. Uh, we, of course, are able to tell wonderful stories and, and build exclusive experiences for our fans with players at the center. Um, but uh, it's, uh, if you build everything on that alone, then when a player moves to another team, then uh, often you lose the fans as well. And so it's, uh, it's a risky proposition. And so basically also to, to simplify, access to player is not like 100% granted in everything you, you can imagine to do, for example. So there is no. limit or there are contracts I can imagine. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, player contracts are often um, very uh, diverse as well. And so, I mean, you're even seeing we have some players that have different contracts than others. We have different, therefore, um, rights to shooting content uh, related to what's uh, on the pitch and around the pitch or totally outside. So I think um, that's an interesting topic. And I think uh, player contract rights are going to continue to evolve. And I, I would anticipate seeing more clubs trying to invest more upfront to gain more exclusive and total rights to mm -hmm. um, player content in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, and again, me being the naive utopian, but <laughs> normally I sit in music, for example, different scenes develop in different ways. The concept of grow, we grow together, I know it's like a stand, kind of true. So I've seen uh, the NFL clubs sharing all of their digital data, YouTube, everything in a platform that uh, the NFL built with 64 dashboard, if I remember well. Oh. And uh, in theory, they're not, in, in NFL, the clubs are a bit competing because they can see, so it's, the fan base is not as loyal as in Europe, but still they're really not competing on, on this front. So they, they put the data together and they could learn a lot. Like I remember at some point there was the Buffalo Bill, whatever at the time, three three people digital team that were scoring in whatever YouTube engagement better than the Patriots. And so they got the guy from the Patriots called and say, what's going on? How do you do it? So this sharing of information is growing the league and football in general. I have the impression that it's not the same here in football in Europe and especially in Italy. Do you think there is an ego perspective or there is a missing understanding of the value of sharing and growing together? Yeah, I mean, I guess my, my naive North American <laughs> view is uh, I'm sharing right now. I mean, even uh, with you now, uh, I'm sharing. My feeling is, as I said earlier, because all of us, all of the teams in Syria are competing for attention with every other sport and every other entertainment, the more we share, then the more all of us uh, get better and then uh, the whole league uh, gets more attention. And so my point of view is uh, we should share learnings more and regularly. The why, I think um, maybe it does stem from uh, history and heritage and the, the diehard nature of one team versus the other from our, our fans today. But I think within the organizations right now, we're all fighting such an intense battle for mm -hmm. uh, livelihood and attention that if we don't share, we actually um, bring ourselves down. Mm. One thing that I forgot to ask more in detail is you mentioned loyalty. Can you define loyalty as you executed here at Juve at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, from a loyalty program, it's uh, something that gives fans the feeling of uh, community, connection, exclusivity. Like it's, it's in this, this realm, uh, so I don't have a specific definition. I think um, most clubs have membership products, which for me aren't loyalty because generally they're uh, uh, first uh, right to buy uh, season tickets. <laughs> They have fan clubs, which definitely has an element of community in them. Uh, but I haven't really seen football clubs dive into building loyalty platforms like you see in, in other industries, whether it's an airline or uh, uh, your trains or your grocery store. Um, mm. I think football clubs, uh, sports teams could um, do a lot within the loyalty sector um, and really innovate uh, to have a touch point with fans on a, on a really regular basis. Yeah, because... To me, it seems the opportunity is there. I understand it's not easy to execute. And maybe uh, very often, I'm personally, I don't like this loyalty program because they always offer things I don't care. But if you, as maybe your target audience is a bit more um, co coherent a bit, it may be easier to create. I think the loyalty thing can 
bring this constant rela relation with the fan. What I'm still surprised, even if I don't have a solution, is that Interior Club should have an easy way to have a relationship, level, a weekly relation with the fan, not just because they watch a game, but there should be a constant exchange. And maybe there is for, but a very small number of fun in general, not for you, I'm just saying in general. I think there is an opportunity, maybe the solution is not obvious. Yeah, well, and I think to your, to your point, I mean, what us and most sports teams uh, struggle with is we've got our, our local base that can come to the stadium and they can uh, spend time with us at uh, our museum, at our hotel, at uh, yeah. the facilities here. But then the, the majority of our fan base is, uh, is not uh, uh, close to the stadium. And that fan base doesn't really have a lot of ways to connect mm. with us, as you said, on a weekly or daily basis. And so the opportunity to have some sort of digital product act as a loyalty uh, mechanism, I think uh, it's, a, it's a big opportunity for, yeah. for Juventus and for, for any sports organization. Yeah. Earlier this year, we, we, we chat a bit uh, how you could use AI to create content and I'm, I, I know that uh, and I've seen that you're doing quite uh, substantially now, so tell me a bit about it. Yeah, so the initial thinking was my belief, as I mentioned earlier, is these feed environments, especially where frequency is important. I think that um, a significant portion of what we're going to see in feed environments in the next few years is going to be AI. And some of it will know it's AI and it'll be obvious and some we will have no idea. And so I'm, I'm happy and a, and a bit afraid of what that's going to look like. <laughs> but what I said to, to my team uh, just uh, around a year ago is let's try to get ahead and let's do some experimentation. And so right now we're using like 15 to 20 different uh, tools that help us with either um, frequency of content uh, to improve the engagement rates on the content that we do um, or to just help us move faster. And so mm -hmm. whether it's uh, dubbing or uh, subtitling or a clipping, uh, we're using all sorts of tools at the moment. Um, and that's a, an interesting space that we've seen some, some good early results. And also, as we've spoken a bit about, um, it's changing so fast. And mm -hmm. so uh, 12 months ago, what we could do with tools versus what we could do now is uh, is it's quite uh, dramatic the, the mm -hmm. difference and so um, it's a constant uh, ongoing experiment but we're starting to dedicate now people to mm -hmm. essentially AI related uh, contents at Juventus. And do you see the fan uh, what, what is the fan reaction is it like a novelty thing so they like it and then they leave it or you think I mean I, I may understand it's early it kind of stick at yeah, certain stakes at a certain point. For me, at first I was wondering, like, do you need to label it as AI? I mean, what's the acceptance going to be? Yeah. Um, so far, it just seems like there's just, there's enjoyment and there's not, yeah. uh, there's not a, uh, like a, a hate because it's done with AI or necessarily a, a like because it's done with AI. Yeah. It's just, it's just seen as content and it's either liked or not liked. There's maybe been uh, one or two times where I've, 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 it's actually created more engagement because I've seen fans debating was that done with AI or wasn't it? <laughs> and so that's a little bit scary, but that's, uh, yeah. that's actually created more engagement on those particular uh, content. But, um, but I, I don't see um, fans reacting in either like an overly negative or overly positive way that it was built with AI. It's just seen as content. Yeah, yeah, cool. Cool, I've seen it, thank you.